Welcome everybody to the American Space Museum. I'm Mark Marquette. And we're so glad you're with us to stay curious. Hope you're out seeing the super moon as this gentleman in India took this photograph of his family. Quite an event out there. Of course, we just had the raining of the uh, hurricane that went by, kind of without incident here on the Space Coast. We were spared by Idalia, but up north in the Big Bend and you up in the Carolinas and Georgia got a lot of rain. We hope Gary Gerald, you're okay up there on your Vidalia farm in Collins, Georgia. We got a neat program for you today that's going to center around what could have been, what could have been the applications of the Gemini spacecraft. In the 1960s, it was going to be the utility vehicle to do things, including go to the moon. Here, my green screen I've chosen here. Uh, is uh, a uh, Centaur rocket that fueled the Gemini around the moon as early as 1965. They thought they could loop around the moon and orbit it in 1966. Well, we'll talk about who are the people behind these concepts and uh, why they were shot down. Yeah, it's just kind of a, a gut feeling that it just wasn't the right way to go. But uh, we're going to hear about uh, some Canadian uh, Canadian space engineers that were very important to the Apollo program. And look at this cool image here of a Centaur rocket that took a Gemini spacecraft to the moon. You got two astronauts just lollygagging around there. Uh, so um, that is our show for today. We want to welcome Selvin Trotter behind the Streamlabs controls and microphone. Hi there, Selvin. Let me stick this chair down here. Marty would have done that if he was here, Selvin. All right. But Marty uh, took a day off today. He's okay. He just has some family business to tend to. And we're glad that Selvin has uh, pinch hit and learned our Streamlabs program real well. Selvin's our bookkeeper here at the American Space Museum. And of course, all of us do much more than just what our titles talk about. But uh, there is a gorgeous uh, moon rising uh, over a mountain. This is a shot that this, this photographer set up months and months ahead of time with a telephoto lens. Let's enlarge that, Selvin, just to show you how gorgeous it was. Hope wherever you saw the full moon rise, called the blue moon because it's the second full moon of the month, uh, ending on the 30th. The first one was, I think, on the second. Every 28 and a half days, uh, the, the moon is the same phase as you see it the day before well because we were closed yesterday uh and prudently so in case there was uh things like electric electric wires down and tree limbs and so forth wasn't the case but because we were off we didn't have a stay curious we replayed winston scott's wonderful conversation with us a month ago uh so you can go back and see that in our archives on youtube but uh, we missed a birthday of a really important gal up there, Megan MacArthur. Happy 52nd birthday to her. There she is on the space station two years ago when she was the pilot for Crew 2. And they uh, broke out uh, everything for her. I, I see there's some uh, probably delicious pepperoni sausage in front of her there. Happy 50th birthday two years ago. She's 52 today. Born August 30th in 1971 in Honolulu, Hawaii, but grew up in Mountain View, California. Uh, so how cool is that, having a birthday on the ISS? Well, just about as cool as having your husband as your partner, and he's an astronaut. In fact, Doug Hurley was the pilot of Crew Dragon 2, the first crewed space flight off the, off, uh, the shores of Kennedy Space Center in 10 years, 11 years. Uh, the, and uh, she, two years later, sat in his seat and was the pilot of Crew Dragon 2. How cool is that? So uh, they're married. Uh, she was a, a space veteran on 125, the last Hubble repair mission, where she's the claim to fame, the last uh, person to touch the space uh, Hubble's telescope with the robotic arm that she was operating. So happy birthday to you, Megan MacArthur. She could fly in space again. Hope she does. She's not an Artemis astronaut, and I'm not clear if she's completely retired. 
but uh, a very experienced astronaut with her husband, Doug Hurley, there. Well, we want to talk about these two gentlemen. Uh, thank you, Mr. Jay Honeycutt, former Kennedy Space Center director, who's been mentoring me a little bit on some of the the uh, the suits, I call them, the, the suits of the Apollo program. And, and Jay Honeycutt certainly was one of those, and he knows all the key players. And these are two Canadians that came into the Apollo program because the Canadian uh, – fighter jet that I'm going to show you here in a minute was canceled. All right. The, uh, the Avro Canada had the aero jet and literally when Jay Honeycutt tells me that when October 4th, 57, when Sputnik orbited the earth, the Canadians canceled almost immediately that program. And it sent some of their best engineers unemployed and two of them were James Chamberlain and Owen Maynard. And uh, Jay Honeycutt tells me that uh, some of the brass from Langley went up in the late 50s now. This is before NASA was NASA. It was the National, um, uh, the national uh, Administration, uh, National Advisory Council for Aeronautics, NACA. Uh, those people went up and talked to these Canadians. They interviewed them, Jay Honeycutt said, on a Wednesday and a Thursday. Monday, they were sitting in their seats in Langley Air Force Base in Virginia working for NASA. Their, uh, everything had been expedited, their visas and so forth. Uh, this created a little bit of a brain drain as far as Canada was concerned. But these two gentlemen had a lot to do uh, an important role in determining the safest way to reach and land on the moon. James Chamberlain was described by space historian David Baker as, quote, probably one of the most brilliant men ever to work for NASA. When I asked Jay Honeycutt about that, he said, well, let me put it this way, Mark. Chris Kraft, the great flight director that created the position flight director, uh, when asked what did James Chamberlain do, he... Chris Kraft's reply was, whatever he wants to do. Uh, he uh, really wanted, on this date in history, announced, proposed a lunar landing by Gemini, okay, uh, thinking that they could land with a, a Saturn C3 booster and the landing could be done by 1966, January. And this is August 61, when Chamberlain proposed that 62 years ago. We're going back to the moon. All kinds of plans are made to go back to the moon. I'm trying to tie in that we've been thinking about this for 60 years and haven't been back in over 50 years. So, uh, uh, and I'm going to end the program with a couple concepts you might not know about to go back to the moon. <clears throat> well, Chamberlain suggested a lunar Gemini. We're going to see some pictures of that. He also suggested landing the Gemini spacecraft uh, with a parasol, uh, like a uh, hang glider, if you will, uh, or uh, an ultralight. And I have got a personal connection with that, with my father trying to pioneer the first ultralight. I'll show you a picture of here in a little bit. Uh, Chamberlain uh, became the head of engineering for Project Mercury. Then he was the chief designer for the Gemini spacecraft. Now, we know that Max Faget gets a lot of credit for the Mercury, Apollo, and shuttle. And some of the Gemini, I guess, the heat shield. Also, um, Gus Grissom worked all of the interior controls and so forth and pretty much told everybody where he wanted everything. And therefore, the Gemini spacecraft became the Gus Mobile. Uh, so I would love to know the, the conversations between James Chamberlain and Gus Grissom, and maybe one day we can find out some of those. Um, one thing that Chamberlain favored was a, uh, and here, here we have all these muckety mucks there. Chamberlain's on the far right there. Uh, these are some of the engineers of Canada, and in front of them, uh, their company was, of course, the uh, AV Row plant. Uh, and the Avro Aero project was canceled literally right after Sputnik was orbited because the Canadian government thought that they would have to now go to space to uh, in, in the event of a Cold War confrontation between the Soviet Union and the U.S. 
Uh, Canada's loss turned into America's gain when NASA snapped up 33 of those out of work engineers to join a small team of managing a manned spaceflight program led by Robert Gilruth, the, the great uh, uh, manager of, of NASA's originally the Space Task Group, which grew into Johnson Space Center today. So here is that. Look at how uh, advanced in 1957 the arrow was at the time. A uh, swept wing concept. Uh, this was a fighter uh, a plane, uh, and uh, uh, it was canceled uh, quite quite frequently, almost immediately. And in 1959, these brilliant and professional Canadians arrived at Langley Research Center to begin their new careers. Gilruth apparently couldn't find any American engineers that wanted to join NASA. Uh, because they didn't want to leave leave their secure jobs in the aerospace industry, whether that be at, at Grumman or Lockheed or uh, some Bell, some of these other companies out there. So uh, they had a hard time recruiting them because they didn't want to leave their aviation jobs that were established and work for the unknown NASA and all the unknowns that go into space. And one of the things that Jim Chamberlain pioneered was the low was a lunar orbit rendezvous. There is a couple concepts of going to Earth moon orbit. Were we going to hook up in Earth orbit and then the lander and everything go and directly land on the moon? That'd be the, the, the direct way of doing it. Were they going to send up the lunar lander and then send up the, the, the crew and then another rocket to push them to the moon? Or what this gentleman came up with that, that we celebrate, uh, Hobalt came up with the, uh, he was an Iowa professor, uh, what is his first name, Hobalt, came up with the concept of the lunar orbit rendezvous that Chamberlain championed, okay, which was take everything together and then separate them in lunar orbit, have a mothership with one astronaut and the lunar lander, a separate vehicle, with one or two astronauts that could actually be disposable as the which uh, which is what ended up being but Chamberlain was one of the first ones to propose that uh, and we honor uh, Hobalt and this whole lunar orbit rendezvous at our Space View Park uh, he's in the upper left hand corner at the bronzed reliefs that Sandy Storm did around our Apollo gallery up there to honor all the space workers that's the panel that does that Here's um, oh, gave, there's a uh, Hobalt at uh, uh, the uh, board there describing lunar orbit rendezvous in the early 60s. Uh, that was not the favorite approach of uh, Werner von Braun, the architect of the Saturn V rocket. He wanted to go direct. Well, this is a tease to show you what a Gemini spacecraft on the moon could look like up there, uh, and. Uh, uh, can you take the banner off there, Sullivan? I forget the key to do that. You don't have to do it, but uh, I forget which one that is to take that off. Right. Anyway, this is what the Gemini spacecraft on top. Uh, which key was that? L. L, all right. Thank you. I can do it right there. All right, cool. L for logo. Uh, so this could have been in the late uh, 1960s for sure, uh, uh, mid-60s. Uh, if they wanted to do it, uh, you had to get people behind you wanting to go to the moon like this. Of course, part of the applications for Gemini that never happened, number one, the manned orbiting laboratory. All right, here's a fancy poster depicting the manned orbiting laboratory that uh, could have been expanded to the extent of uh, having a couple interlocking modules on it like the Soyuz spacecraft ended up being of Russia, uh, or you could take a, so you could take more uh, astronauts up there. And how many of you have seen this concept of the Big G? You see there on the side, the Big Gemini, a pilot and a commander in the normal Gemini taking up some passengers up there with them, like a, a taxi. Though today you're inclined to say Uber instead of taxi. Uh, which is a great TV cut sitcom, by the way, if you haven't seen that in a while. Um, and this was a this is being built at McDonald 
in St. Louis. This is where this picture was taken. Uh, so it was very much a real concept at the time, Selvin. And here's a cutaway of it showing you uh, could have took five people, maybe six. Uh, okay, everybody strap in. You know, uh, we got a couple windows for you to look out there. And uh, hang on and we'll let you know when we're in orbit or at the mole laboratory or uh, transferring you to a, a moon rocket. So uh, this is a little known concept called uh, Big Gemini. A real concept, though. What's that? What's that picture say there? 1968, 12, 27, 68, left side view of the Gemini uh, mock-up landing added landing attitude with the uh, skids out on the on the floor there. All right, that was the concept. There's Chamberlain again. Look at the uh, the Gemini spacecraft on his desk there. Uh, they were thinking about uh, the Gemini flights having 14 of them. In August 14th, 1961, Mercury Mark II, two Roman numeral program, went like this. They were going to do like they did, uh, unmanned, then manned, and then a seven-day, a uh, couple seven-day missions, then some docking, then a 14-day mission, then more Agena docking, then another 14-day mission, spacewalks and docking. And then they were going to take a Centaur rocket, like shown here in my background picture, and uh, take it to a high Earth orbit, do that a couple times with Gemini 11 and 12, and then in March 1965, it was on the drawing board to dock with a Centaur, boost it to a lunar flyby, which is shown here. Two lunar flybys were planned in March and May 1965, and then... With a, a mere eight million dollars more than the three hundred and sixty, uh, they proposed uh, that they could be landing on the moon by January uh, nineteen sixty-seven. So uh, quite an escalated program there. If they would have opted for just a nine-flight program, they wanted to fly around the moon by May nineteen sixty-four. Now this is the early dawn of the space age where. So many unknowns in science fiction fueling the concepts and the ideas. And the idea was, let's get to the moon. And then we can do a lot more things like build the bases. But uh, it was thought once we mastered space travel that we'd just be flying all the time. And yet, of course, we've seen big gaps in the program. Well, Chamberlain also proposed on this date uh, in 1961... Uh, 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 he, he proposed the lunar landing, and he also proposed that we land Gemini by a paracel wing, okay? A task force was put together. Uh, one, of our national uh, one of our national treasures here, Bob Giffen, worked at uh, North American, North American Rockwell, merged eventually. To put this concept together, there's an actual test flight of a Gemini spacecraft dummy landing with wheels on the desert with a triangular parasol wing. And when I went to the Smithsonian a couple years uh, with Marty, uh, I couldn't believe that I saw the parasol wing up in the sky like that because I've got a personal story about this. This is very, very familiar to me. There is again, well, let's, let's look back here before I show you how familiar I am with it. There's the wing up there. Of course, uh, other spacecraft are below it. Uh, there it is in the Smithsonian with the landing gear, the actual one that was used in the picture I showed you with the parasol. Bob Giffen, bless your heart. Uh, he's, uh, of course, like all these Apollo guys, just he's not in ill health, but not getting around much. He told me that he actually packed that parasol in the, the long box that they sent to Smithsonian for this exhibit uh, like 30 years ago. Uh, in his career. Uh, so you look at that picture, and then you look at this picture. And yep, that's my dad there with the helmet and the, the flight uh, uh, outfit on there. That's my little brother Craig sitting in a go-kart frame that my dad put a triangular wing on, and that's me uh, clapping my hands, I guess, with my back to you and my dad's buddies. 
my dad was quite an interesting uh, entrepreneur. He always tried to invent things. He was a, I call him a crazy uh, um, uh, experimental uh, aviation guy. EAA is the group, experimental uh, aviation, uh, uh, EAA, experimental uh, amateur avionics or uh, something. They meet in Oshkosh, Wisconsin every year. And yep, he had a crash there too. He got an idea of the ultralight, though it wasn't called that. This is 1963. I'm nine years old. And my, these guys in a station wagon would pull my dad behind a rope on a grass runway of an airport. And he'd get some lift. He'd let go of the rope with the device. He, he had a latch. And he landed about four times with it. The fifth time... When the station wagon hit 80 miles an hour, he hit a rut, which sent him straight up. He blacked out, and I distinctly remember seeing the rope go limp and the thing tumble down. And my dad nearly lost his life. He had some of those tubes punched in his ribs. He, he broke a wrist, a leg, an ankle, and uh, but uh, he survived it and uh, lived to fly again. Then he put go-kart racing motors on, on boats and called them go-boats. But uh, my dad was quite a, uh, a professional go-kart driver back in the 60s uh, and uh, had a lot of trophies from winning races and stuff. But that was his dream to fly an ultralight in 1963 before anybody knew about ultralights. So uh, to reinforce that plastic, by the way, is fiberglass tape. You can just barely see on there. So uh, dad passed away a few years ago. My brother and I love honoring him by thinking of these crazy stories of his aviation career. So, uh, but there it is again. Uh, you look at the landing gear. Imagine all of this going to space and then working to land. Now they said, let's just, that's too much. If too many things can go wrong. We've got too many things that have to go right. Let's just land the astronauts in the ocean like we did the Mercury guys and uh, leave it at that because we do have that down pat. So a great chapter of space history that maybe many of you don't know about when we tried to land on a paracel, the Gemini spacecraft. And I looked up there and I could see my dad flying that thing at the Smithsonian. And uh, he wasn't alive when I took this picture. I would certainly enjoyed showing that to him. Well, the blue moon, the new, the full moon, you know, has a lot of repercussions. And there's the full moon rising over the Roman numeral two, the iconic symbol of the Gemini program. Of course, Gemini, the Roman brothers that uh, basically Romulus and Remus that founded Rome is another one of the mythologies. The two brothers of Gemini, the two astronauts going to space and eventually landing on the moon. Well, that was, again, Chamberlain and uh, Owen uh, uh, Maynard and some of these other Canadians. They really pushed that we ought to accelerate this program. As we've learned to live in space, let's just keep pushing it and go to the moon and learn to live there. This, of course, for those of you not familiar with the Gemini spacecraft, uh, when you're in the front seat of your vehicle, just look at the person beside you. You probably have got twice the amount of roominess in there. Uh, or think of a, a small old Volkswagen and you two sitting there. That's about the space you had. The goal wings opened up. When you closed them, you were looking right out those windows constantly. And we always tell people that the white part of the spacecraft, the astronauts did not get in. That is where the controls, the gas tanks, fuel tanks, oxygen tanks, all the avionics and all the support systems were there except the reentry things that had to be on the nose there that you see in this cutaway. And there's Bob Crippen in Gemini 2, the only at the time re reusable spacecraft out of Cape Canaveral. You see the hole cut in the, uh, uh, the re-entry heat shield there. That was an experiment because they would have to have a hole cut in the heat shield to get into the mole laboratory because uh, they weren't going to do it by a spacewalk getting into it. They wanted easy access and this proved that they could do it. Uh, and uh, Bob will be celebrating his 86th birthday next next a week from Sunday. Well, a couple of the Gemini concepts that uh, were thought about. There's the Agena rocket concept at the top, which they did and docked with the Agena rocket, I think, four times uh, in that uh, 10 mission Gemini two-year program in 1965 and 66. 
And then they had the uh, Centaur rocket, much bigger, with more fuel, to take them to the moon. And then they would take another Centaur rocket that had the lander. This was a landing concept, maybe a one-person lander that would land on this. And this would be the rocket that uh, would, uh, as the Gemini spacecraft is in orbit, with one astronaut or two, they had put this together. It wasn't clear how they were going to get on that one-man lander, uh, but uh, then land on the moon. Or this was the concept that you see a lot. Uh, a uh, big rocket with the Gemini spacecraft on top of it. And uh, when you are familiar with the SpaceX Starship, this looks very familiar to the Starship image on the moon. Um and it's got reusable atmospheric wings on it, like that's going to land apparently in the Earth's atmosphere after it's on the moon. And hang on, hang on to the rope. <laughs> we're, we're ratcheting you down. And it looks like a guy's starting a fire over there by the leg, but of course you can't do that on the moon. But he's picking up rocks, of course. So that was one concept that crossed the, the, the didn't quite get to the blueprint stage. But uh, Chamberlain had some other ideas. And a couple of his concepts, when you look at the other vehicles that he was involved in, here's a relationship of how big the Mercury was compared to the Gemini, compared to the three-man Apollo. All right. Now, you take they should take the service module off the Gemini on the back, and then you kind of get a truer idea. It wasn't that much bigger than the Mercury. Okay. You just had enough room to stick another person in there. How about this for a concept of landing on the moon? All right, we're just going to throw out a bunch of landing legs. We don't know what the surface is like, so let's make them like some giant forks, okay? That's what they look like to me, Selvin, is giant forks there uh, landing on the moon. Eh, kind of a, and kind of an, uh, an Atlas uh, or, or Titan rocket was what that would look like that launched it, some sort of variation. That Titan would be the lander. The Centaur had taken it that far away, as seen in this picture here. So, and then landing on the moon, yep. Okay, we're just at the right angle where we can, uh, we can sling you down to the surface. Good luck with that, okay. Uh, but it is a pretty cool concept. They even threw the Earth in the background without any clouds around it. Selvin, that's a thing you see often in the 50s and 60s, early 60s, when you see uh, concepts of the Earth in the sky. They don't have enough clouds on it. It wasn't until uh, the weather satellites started beaming back pictures that we realized, hey, most of the Earth is covered with clouds all the time. So uh, I don't know if I'd be a, like to be the astronaut on the end of that rope. Uh, I, uh, I don't, not clear how you're going to get back up. Okay, because uh, I don't see any winch on the bottom there, but that was a true concept. Here's again the concept that I have on our green screen. And here was the one-man lunar lander. See the lower left-hand corner picture? There you get an idea that this guy would just land on the moon on this kind of uh, hopper. They could hop around it too, had enough uh, uh, fuel on it that it could go around a little bit. He could uh, get out and take some uh, uh, more pictures or collect more samples looks like it had a contained uh, structure on it but when these things were uh, contained cockpit is what i'm trying to say for uh some uh, atmospheric control there outside of his spacesuit maybe not maybe it's just going to be on the spacesuit itself but uh, chamberlain uh, he was the one that proposed this design Again, the idea was, let's get there, let's make sure we can get there, and then we'll think about all kinds of things we can build on the moon once we get there. Uh, so, But basically, after August 1961, when Chamberlain proposed these ideas, by late September 61, uh-uh, we ain't going to do that. Uh, so it was, it was a brief month in space history that these ideas were really thought about. Well, some people have taken them a little further, Okay, this is a, an artist, Jeff Bateman, that I'll give credit to, that I pulled off the internet, having some advanced concepts of a Gemini spacecraft there, going to space with a landing vehicle. That would be the retro rockets that stopped it, put it in orbit, and then it lands on the moon like that. Pretty cool concept. 
At least they have a ladder <laughs> on the side there. And then just like the the uh, concept of the lunar module, this concept back in the 60s, let's uh, have a descent stage with its own engine and an ascent stage. And maybe that maybe they're both in this. Uh, not clear about that if that ascent stage was also the descent stage just in that more rigid structure there. Well, artist Day, uh, Don McKay, for a long time, did Christmas cards. And I throw this out there. That this is a concept of the Gemini Space Program that Don McKay embraced. Uh, that uh, The checkerboard pattern there of orange and white. Oh, and this Christmas card Don McKay did. Oh, yeah. That reminds me of the Vols. Go Vols this weekend. They're playing the University of Virginia. The Cavaliers, I know Bob Seek will be rooting for the Cavaliers along with Kathy Thornton, both of them alums. But this is Neyland Stadium in Knoxville, Tennessee on a football Saturday evening, which I've been in that crowd a couple dozen times, I got to happily say. Living 35 years, about 90 miles from there in Johnson City, Bristol area. Checkerboard on the end zones is their trademark. And a couple times a year, they have a they, they tell the crowd in each section what to wear. And uh, I just wonder if Don McKay was from Tennessee when I look at these Gemini concepts there. And uh, uh, Chris Callie, do you know that for sure? Let me know, brother. He's another world-famous artist just like Don McKay. But uh, so football season, Selvin, we're glad about that, aren't we? We are. That's right. And uh, I'm still a Buckeye. Go Bucks! But uh, I love it when Tennessee wins and uh, I snicker when they lose as long as Ohio State wins that week. Well, here is President Kennedy with uh, Bob Gilruth on the right. That uh, Basically, uh, uh, he created what was being done at Johnson Space Center with Chris Kraft is probably in that crowd. You see President John, uh, uh, Vice President Johnson. This was one of the lunar concepts that was coming out at the time, that this is how we were going to land on the moon behind him. Before President Kennedy died, this is what he thought was going to be the moonship. And there's another concept that Grumman came up with when they got the contract for the lunar module. Five landing legs, four windows, an exit, circle circular exits okay but and here we have that in our space museum we're so proud to have this grumman module from 1961 uh we think it's worth every bit of ten thousand dollars or more uh though it's got some damage to it it's not in pristine but we love having this in our museum i think it's one of our centerpieces there you have on the background buzz aldrin at the eagle lem 5 on the moon and to the left is what it became, four legs instead of five, and rectangular exits because of the backpack on the right there was, was rectangular in shape, the personal life support system. So uh, we're proud to have this concept uh, that was so cool to look at in books before I moved down here. And then I go, holy cow, they've got a lunar module concept from Grumman just sitting on the floor there. This was our our moonship. All those concepts of the early 60s by Chamberlain and the Canadians, along with Gilruth's task force, uh, this is what it ended up being. The, the command module on the right with the service module and just that little cone shape is all that comes back. Of course, the lunar module on the left, the only spacecraft built to work entirely in the uh, vacuum of space with the astronauts standing up, not sitting down. And then the only vehicle still yet built that it was made to lift off another world. Now, this is an incorrect concept here, and I wouldn't expect you to notice that, Selvin. But if Marty was here, he would say, oh, that lunar module's wrong, unless it's in Earth orbit. Because you see the, the, the drogue, the, uh, uh, the poles sticking off of the pads. Those are the contact light poles. They're five feet long. They did not have one over the lander, uh, the uh, exit ladder that you see on the left there. They didn't want one there in case it broke, which they all broke and stuck up and the astronauts uh, couldn't get down because they get poked in the butt by it, <laughs> quite frankly. So, but still, what? The devil's in the details. 
but we know you on Stay Curious love the details. And that configuration would have to be in Earth orbit to have that data probe on the left. That Once that hit, a blue light went on the console, Grumman Blue, that contact light, and the astronaut was supposed to shut off the engine. They were supposed to fall that last five feet because there were shock absorbers in the, those legs. Most of the time, they kept that engine going until it was, was firmly on the ground. Well, of course, there is. That's Apollo 12. That's what it looked like. Lem number six on the moon there. Uh, intrepid. And never gets old. But you know what? It's been 50 years since that mission landed on the moon. 50 four uh, years in November, to be exact. Then there's a con another art concept of blasting off the moon. Okay, we love looking at, at how it was and how it was thought to be and, and how it actually was. When you look at the mountains of the moon, they're not as jagged and sharp because they've been beat down by micrometeorites for over uh, a billion years. But there's a good, accurate uh, Earth in the sky there with plenty of clouds covering it. Now, this is the concept that many people don't understand is what is being proposed for the first two, maybe three lunar landings. And that is Artemis uh, 4, I believe, is the one that they want to land. Artemis 2 and then 3, 2 is going to pass by the moon. 3, that could be a lander, but I think they just want to orbit the moon. And then 4, definitely be a lander with Starship on the right there. That is the gateway. It's just going to be a small space station, all right? Uh, just a, a couple cylinders together, enough room for two or three astronauts to get out of each other's way uh, for a while. But then there's the taxi going up, the uh, Orion spacecraft. The Orion spacecraft is not going to land on the moon. It is only designed to get astronauts to the vicinity of the moon to the gateway. And that's a concept we have there. There is the starship on the moon. Uh, look at that concept there that Elon Musk is is working on this whole elevator situation. They want to take rovers with them. Uh, the first stay on the moon may have to be up to two weeks for everything to line up again. And why not stay while you're there as long as you got plenty of food? But look at how the people on the ground there, Selvin. This is a gigantic rocket to land on the moon. Uh and what's what's the relationship to it to the the last time we did it 50 some years ago there it is there is the grumman lunar module on the right and the spacex starship on the left to scale all right about 23 feet tall for the uh lunar lander there and i think it's 170 feet something like that 150 feet for the starship so uh you know, uh, a lot of concepts have come and gone. And I found this picture researching this show from 1961. What are they building here? Not a big donut, okay, uh, for Homer Simpson. All right, no, that'd be delicious. No, they're building this in 1961. These are engineers at Langley uh, in Virginia putting together an experimental module a, a, a for a zero-G rotational like the 2001 Space Odyssey movie to keep this constantly moving and artificial gravity and everything like that on there. So 1961, folks, we've been thinking a lot about going back to the moon uh, lately, but we've been thinking about for over 60 years and thought that we would have cities in space and on the moon by now, quite frankly. But it'll happen just on what time frame. I probably won't be around to see much of it. This is another concept that, that uh, many people don't. Uh, uh, this is Lockheed Martin. Lockheed Martin and Blue Origin have not given up on their lunar module concepts. In fact, the plan is for Artemis 3 and 4 to land on the moon. It might end up being 4 and 5, but Artemis 6 and 7 are definitely the uh, Grumman concept of their lunar module, Northrop Grumman, to be on the moon in, uh, in a vehicle, something like this that Lockheed Martin has proposed. This is the Lockheed Martin concept at the gateway, all right, with the... Uh, uh, the Uber Orion is parked on the right side there. You see his solar panels. There's another Lockheed Martin concept of what was their Mars ship, 
All right, looks a lot like the starship, and it looks a lot like the Gemini on steroids landed on the moon. I love it uh, that uh, the, there's two astronauts on the moon, and one's waving to him, like, hey, I'm over here. Like, uh, we're the only two humans on the moon. I can't see you. <laughs> and there is another Lockheed Martin concept of their moon ship. That looks pretty cool and also looks pretty feasible in my mind. Well, we hope that you've enjoyed this look back at uh, what could have been Gemini going to the moon. It was a real concept, a real idea to do it. Uh, then the, the Apollo, it was decided to take slow down. Let's put the brakes on this thing, everybody. Uh, and uh, came up with the concept of the, uh, the big rocket, Saturn V, the command module with the, the, the uh, capsule for the humans, the return to Earth the mothership, so to speak, and then, of course, the lunar lander, three separate things. Uh, and and uh, Jim Chamberlain had a lot to do with that. And he's one of the Canadians that uh, Owen Maynard, another one that I showed you pictures of early on his stamp. Uh, they're really, again, some hidden figures of the space program. And I thank uh, Jay Honeycutt, former director of Space Center, for turning me on to the stories of these great men. So uh, we'll talk more about them as time goes on. There's also a book uh, Jay said to read. It's about the Arrow, uh, Google Canadian Arrow uh, aircraft. I forget the exact name of it, but uh, I'll be picking that up and learning about that. So, well, y'all get outside. Uh, you know, it. Uh, we still got a lot of moonshine to get. The moon's going to land after... Uh, about to that, uh, tonight it rises about 8.50, a little bit before uh, 9 o'clock, wherever you're at. This is a photograph I took of a super moon over the Appalachian Mountains a few years ago. Uh, so wherever you're at, go out there and check out the moon. Remember, you can always cover it up with your little finger there. All right. It's a half a degree across. That means 180 moons could be stacked end to end. From the horizon to directly overhead 90 degrees and then another 180 and then 90 degrees the opposite direction yet it is so big in our minds and imagination of mankind since caveman looked up there and wondered what it was i'm sure and and uh man has thought for over 200 years is seriously going back to it in science fiction and now science fact we're going to do it again so Thank you, everybody, for enjoying today's show. Please tell your friends to, uh, uh, if you enjoyed our program today, to watch us on YouTube. If you didn't enjoy it, don't tell anybody, okay? <laughs> Selvin, thank you for a great job today. Anything, uh, uh, you got some, uh, give me a, who was watching today that I need to shout out to. We're going to have a SpaceX launch, we believe, tonight. The weather's been very iffy. Uh, we had storms roll in that are the outer bands of things. So, uh, uh, Selvin, you got some shout outs there for us, buddy? I do. We have Dave Stengi, Cynthia Rossi, Robert Law, Tom Uziek, uh, Michael Mikowski, Gary Girio, Cliff Watson, and William Whiting. And hello to Bill. Bill, we say hi. All right. Hello to everybody out there. Thank you, Cliff, for watching in Australia. Our Michigan boys up there. Don't know if the Big Ten's kicking off this week. But because uh, I've been too busy to look and it's only Thursday. So, everybody, we hope that you're safe and, and happy wherever you are watching this program. We uh, hope our friends in the Georgia and the Carolinas uh, didn't get too much flooding. Uh, here in the Space Coast, very few deaths reported. Uh, those winds were packing 150 miles an hour when they hit the, the bend up there and quickly uh, went down. So we're in the middle of that season. We're on alert, and our first hurricanes passed by, Selvin, and everything's A-OK -okay here at the American Space Museum. So tomorrow we're going to whip up some space news uh, about the moon, see what's going on with that Chandra rover that uh, India has on the moon. We understand from some of our foreign visitors here in our museum that the Russians are very embarrassed that their Luna 25 crashed on the moon and India's uh, didn't. So uh, we'll dig into some of those stories a little bit and have a, uh, some more space history and a little bit of future Friday for you tomorrow. So until then, I'm Mark Marquette saying thank you for 
visiting our websites, our Facebook pages, and our YouTube pages. Our humble nonprofit, the American Space Museum, does need your support. So until tomorrow, I can't wait to see you to bridge the space between us.